Welcome to the Power Hour today, Bob Chapman. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much for reiterating uh, the business history of my life and the fact that I, every day, take Strauss heart heart drops. (laughs) The most important thing, yes. Keeps him alive, doing what he's doing. But you have written the International Forecaster, which is getting a lot of attention. I had so many people email me and say, guess what Bob Chapman just said in his newsletter. And this International Forecaster newsletter, if you're not taking it, We'll tell you how to get it a little bit later, but, I mean, it is amazing. And uh, talk to me about this recent event that you talked about with the Chinese and what you uh, created such a stir over, Bob. Well, actually, I picked up a piece from the uh, EU Times, and uh, this matter had been discussed behind the scenes uh, for the last couple of years, but nothing had ever come out that, was definitive uh, about the uh, Chinese being able to uh, use the debt instruments that they purchased from the U.S. government to be able to buy American assets. And to me, it always seemed to be a natural, natural extension of their participation in the U.S. debt market and something that the United States might secretly do with them uh, so that uh, they would continue to purchase Treasury and agency securities. And so I thought it was probable. Uh, Anyway, the EU Times uh, carried a story, and then the EU Times disappeared. And I have not been able to get any further update uh, I've had friends in Washington try to trace it down through the State Department. I can't get anything out of there. And uh, they know who I am uh, because uh, they get my publication uh, every time it comes out. And they're the ones that send it to all the embassies and the consulates in the world, and the U.S., that is. But uh, I have not been able to further verify the story that we harvested from the EU Times. Okay, well, uh, along with that, though, we've got this uh, story coming out of the uh, uh, blacklistednews.com saying that China is preparing for a treasury bond sell-off uh, by, by uh, going through the U.K., then buying up for the Chinese. Do you know anything about that? No, I don't, but I have always suspected, and this goes back a number of years, I will say about 11 years, that what the Federal Reserve was doing is that they had accounts in London and uh, in the Cayman Islands and buying in treasuries and agencies that were coming from those locations where you cannot identify who the buyer is unless you go in and look at somebody's files. Of course, you can't do that. Uh, I've always suspected they they were big buyers secretly, and they were covering it up. And until we can get an audit of the Fed, we're never going to find out. And that's what Ron Paul's been after. But uh, as far as the Chinese, they're perpetual sellers now, and they have been for a number of months. There was one month, I think it might have been November, where they were net buyers uh, that you could see. But... Uh, when they made the purchases of the bonds for Greece, Portugal, and Spain just recently, uh, I was told that they were seller of treasuries in order to get that money to be able to purchase those bonds. The treasuries that they own, on average, are uh, yielding about three quarters of one percent. They don't go into the long end of the market very often, which would be 7, 10, and 30-year notes and bonds. So they were getting a very low yield. So what they did was they sold the treasuries, took the funds, and purchased the bonds I spoke of, which are yielding around 7%, so there's a big difference. And But they're doing those kind of things all the time, and they have been. Don't forget they got money coming in every day 
from the sale of securities, uh, I mean, from the money coming in every day for the income from exports. So they have to do something with the money. And uh, they're trying to get rid of it all the time because they got too much of it, probably close to a trillion dollars. Well, China is the biggest holder, we all know that, of U.S. government debt. What is it, uh, $890 billion? Well, that's, dollars? that's the figure. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the Treasury, uh, excuse me, the Federal Reserve just surpassed them this past week. Of they only... now own more than the Chinese and, of course, the Japanese, which I guess have about $800 billion, something in that category. So there's three big holders now. Number one, the Federal Reserve, which makes money up out of thin air to do that, and then the Chinese, and then the Japanese. And the holdings of U.S. dollar-denominated assets have dropped from about 66% to around 59, 59.5% uh, over the last two years. So in general, the holding of U.S. securities has dwindled as the value of the dollar has gone down. All right, we're going to go to this break. Four minutes, then we'll be back. And I'm going to ask the question, why don't all the starving countries just print their own money, print meaning add zeros to the bottom line, so they can uh, pay all their starving people? Why doesn't everybody do this? We'll be back after this four-minute break with more of the Power Hour. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Power Hour. Thank you for joining us. It is 24 minutes after the hour. You are at the Power Hour, and you are also with Bob Chapman. He is the editor of the International Forecaster Newsletter, and to get a copy of it, to find out how to get a free year's subscription, if you purchase from Midas Resources, call 800-686-2237, 800-686-2237. You can also go to theinternationalforecaster.com, theinternationalforecaster.com. And, again, that is 800-686-2237. Bob Chapman, why is it that we don't just have every country out there adding zeros to their bottom line? They could pay for all the food they want in Bangladesh by doing the same thing we do. Have they not figured out how we do it in the United States? Well, yes, they have. Uh, we have to remember that the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency. And so they can do things other countries can't do because foreign exchange reserves are usually held in U.S. dollars because it's a reserve currency and also sometimes in other things such as gold and, and, uh, and silver and so on. But... Every country is increasing their money supply and their credit availability. It's just not to the tune that the U.S. Federal Reserve has. You take the European Central Bank, they're doing the same thing. Uh, they have loans out, outrageous loans at around 1%. They keep on getting rolled and rolled and rolled because it's cheap money. And... Uh, uh, and so it is going on out there, but not to the extent that it has been and probably will continue to be with the U.S. dollar because of its status. Well, but it seems like, I mean, I don't, I don't understand the system well enough to know why, but it seems like a poor country like Bangladesh or Libya or anyone else, they could just print internal money within their country, buy food, from whatever supplier within their country, and they'd be doing the same thing that we're doing here. I mean, I, I well, guess I they, don't understand if they did that, the value of their currency would drop, and uh, we don't know whether they want that to happen or not. And that usually is a reason that they will increase money and credit, but not anywhere near what the Europeans, uh, the British, and the Americans are, but they are doing it. Yeah, but that doesn't I mean, seem some, to bother us. All the nations out there have got very strong growth with virtually no stimulus. Uh, Canada and Mexico are two examples. 
they're both growing at about four and a half percent, and their unemployment rates are very low. Uh, they range in the four, five, six percent area, and uh, and but they create money and credit, but they don't do it the way the U.S. does in that great amount, so to speak. Well, it just seems to well, anyway, I'm going to open up the phone lines also because I know a lot of people want to ask you questions, and we never seem to give you enough time uh, with our listeners at 800-259-9231. Start lining up, 800-259-9231. Stock market has been up, taking a couple of dives lately. Gold is back up again. Um, it took, you know, I mean, that, t- that was a $100 hit that gold took earlier. I haven't seen what silver is doing today, but it seems like everything is rebounding, including the stock market. That's true. And uh, the reason the market has been as strong as it has is that the transnational corporations, banking and Wall Street, which usually buys treasury securities, among many other things, has not had to do that since last June. Because the Federal Reserve, creating money out of thin air, has been buying treasuries and agency securities. And they say that they've bought about four or five hundred billion dollars worth. And I don't believe that for a second. Uh, they have ways of covering up their buying. And um, I think they, they have probably purchased somewhere around uh, 1.3 trillion dollars worth. And so the people in the markets, they don't get calls from Washington saying, let's say at J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, look, you got to go in and buy some of these treasuries. There's too many of them out there. We can't uh, handle it. And that hasn't happened. So what does Morgan and, and Goldman and all these other firms do? Uh, they take the money and they speculate with it. Mm-hmm. And they speculate on everything uh, with leverage. Okay, we got a break. We'll be back three minutes, and we'll be back with Bob Chapman. Take your phone calls, 800-259-9231. We're talking to Bob Chapman today, and the subject is uh, whatever you want to talk to him about, because we want you to get your questions answered, and many of you have better questions than I could ever think of. So with uh, let me just ask you, Bob, is there anything you'd like to add about what's going on or what we need to be watching before we go to the phone calls? Well, I think uh, one last little bit, and that is that countries continue to pump up their currencies, and it's a way of keeping uh, the machine going, so to speak. But the Western Europeans and the United States are the ones who are really pumping them up, and those are the currencies that are cont- continue to come under pressure. And you only can measure currencies against gold and silver. You can't any longer compare them to one another because most of the stronger currencies or the bigger currencies, I should say, are uh, all doing the same thing. And so when you want to find out what they're doing, you have to look to gold and silver and see how much value that they've lost over the last few months or the last 10 years. Okay. Uh, Let's go to, I still, I don't know. The monetary system, I think, is being so used and abused that I don't think we have any idea how much money is really available in the terms in terms of wealth. And I don't think we have any wealth left in this country, so all we have is, uh, you know, fiat money. Let's go to, and I want to thank Quito, Ecuador, and Costa Rica for emailing. Uh, glad to know you're down there listening. Let's go to Dave in Texas. Dave in Texas, you're on with Bob Chapman. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Joyce. Morning. Good- Good to talk to you and Bob again. I was going to ask another question, but very one quick comment about the monetary since you bring, you mentioned that. The one of the ways I look at currencies is what is the jet to, debt to GDP ratio of the countries in question. And the truth of the matter is, many of the other world currencies are even worse off in their jet debt to GDP ratio than the dollar is, and actually should be weaker against the dollar than they currently are, and the currencies markets are being entirely manipulated by the big international bankers to produce market results that they want. They do this in oil, they do it in stocks, they do it in commodities, and they do it in currencies, and none of the currencies are properly valued against one another. None of them are properly valued against commodities. Oil is priced way too high. 
I was going to ask about the Libya situation, because they're trying to pump up oil prices. I think they actually fomented the rebellion in Libya to try to create a crisis they could then use as an excuse to jack up oil prices for profiteering purposes. And if they go in for a military operation in Libya, I would oppose that. I don't believe the United States should basically get involved in Libya like we did in Iraq or other countries and possibly invade and send U.S. troops in there. Okay, if let me just stop that, you. Let me stop you. You're making some really, really good points. I don't want to miss them here. First of all, Bob, why is debt to GDP ratio important, and why would we look at that? Well, it's a further commitment to uh, solving debt that they've already incurred that has to be paid back. Uh, the figures vary pretty widely. Uh, in China, we have a, a, a China. Uh, we have in Japan, we have the figure that's over 250 times GDP. And you say, well, gee, uh, how come the yen is so strong recently and has been for some time when they have this outrageous debt-to-GDP ratio? Okay, explain debt-to-GDP ratio. Just explain those in case there's any homeschooling children that might not know what that means. Well, GDP is the production of goods and services within an economy. And the debt divided into that would give you the ratio. The... 250% Japan has, they look at it differently because all of the debt is to the Japanese people. Uh, they have some external debt, but it's inconsequential. On the other hand, China, uh, I don't know what the debt to GDP ratio is, but I do know that most of their debt is internal as well. And one of the reasons for that is their surplus in trade and, uh, and in the United States, where is it now? Um, it's probably around 82 to 85 times GDP. And by the end of the year, it could be easily over 100. And you want to compare it to something? My. Compare it to uh, Portugal, uh, Greece, Spain. Uh, they're in the same category. So uh, the U.S. dollar is really not that much better off than those currencies that are in serious trouble. And why is there a big difference? Because the U.S. has the world reserve currency, and then other, those other countries do not. All right. Thank you very much. And let me go back to um, uh, Dave, who has g really good questions here. Now, you wanted to ask a question about Libya. Do you have a question about it? or? Yes. Uh, my basic thing I was going to say on Libya is, Invading, if, if the United States, if Obama's administration decides to militarily intervene in Libya directly, that would be a mistake. I don't favor Gaddafi, let me be clear about that. But it's not the U.S.'s place to intervene in Libya. Uh, the problem they'll do is, what I think they may attempt to do is, is, is disrupt Libya's capacity to export oil. Get this, to, re to cut oil supplies, to create artificial scarcity that would not naturally happen so as to jack up oil prices. And they actually want that, the, the oh, oil yeah. traders, perversely, because oh. they're trying to profiteer on consumers. No That's doubt. Oil prices have been going up artificially. They, they've actually mispriced recently, even before Libya. They used the overseas Brent price, which is higher than the West Texas Intermediate, to m make the gas stations raise all their prices suddenly, even mm -hmm. just before Libya. So they're, they're, they're cheating American consumers on you higher know, than necessary I, oil prices. Yes, I'm so glad you brought up that Brent price. I noticed that also, and I thought, what are they doing, referring to the Brent price? Uh, uh, Bob, do you want to respond to that? Yes, and in, in a slightly different way, um, Saudi Arabia says that they will step in and they will supply the crude oil that Libya is not producing to the market. Problem is that Libya's crude is a perfect feed for ultra low sulfur diesel. And if Saudi Arabia were to replace the number of barrels of diesel that you can get from one Libyan barrel, you would need three Saudi barrels to do the same thing. So they would have to produce, which is 2% of the world consumption from Libya, they would have to come up with three times as much oil as Libya is pumping out of the ground. 
That's amazing. That is amazing. Well, I think that um, this is all about bringing the price of oil up in North Dakota and Alaska as they are doing increased drilling in both of those areas. And, of course, Lindsay Williams is um, making these major predictions like the price of oil is going to go up. Well, duh. I don't think anybody doesn't see that now. I mean, it's obvious that that's what's happening. I just think it is all by design, and I think that the Libyan uh, chaos is being created there, and it's uh, it's time for him to go, and so they're going to get him out in a, in a manner in which they can create the most chaos. That's my own personal opinion. Thank you very much, Dave. You always have such good comments. There's so many to choose from there. Thank you, Dave. Let's go to Eric in Washington. Eric, you're on with Bob Chapman. Go ahead, please. Hey, hey Joyce. Uh, hey, you're right on with your uh, train of thought as far as uh, currency is concerned. Uh, study community currencies, uh, and you'll kind of get some insight into that. And uh, what I'd like to say is that uh, cash, to be specific, not money, uh, is a storage of uh, – it, it's a storage, okay? You, you borrow a dollar, and you have to pay it back. That's what it's backed by. It's, a, it's just a book entry. It's a debit and a credit. Mm-hmm. Uh, we throw around the word debt just as we throw around the word bank, which is actually a broker – and when you say debt, you're actually saying debit and credit. So when you say there's a lot of debt out there, you're saying there's a lot of debit and credit out there. Uh, somebody has the debit. Somebody has the credit. Uh, when we, you know, inflation is caused by defaults on the debits and leaving extra credits out there. It's not uh, increasing the so-called money supply. Uh, it. You, you, you know, you borrow a dollar, you have to pay it back. That's what it's backed by. Yeah, well, I thank you very much for that. This is the Thinking People's Radio, as you can tell by the listeners that call in here. Uh, Bob, any response to what Eric had to say? Oh, well, he's right. Um, uh, it, um, it, it, the, the simpler way to say it is that when an economy wants money, the central bank creates it. And, um, yes, it's supposed to be paid back, but sometimes it isn't. And cash or dollars are actually, in economic terms, are uh, explained as a store of value, uh, which is the same as what he said. It's just a probably a more descriptive term. You know, I just want to go back to the issue of uh, printing up more money. That is the using that term, printing up more money, when we know it is just credits and debits. But what about the idea, though, that we could say, well, it appears that, um, I mean, why don't we just take our – uh, money and uh, repay all those people in Katrina that had their dis- homes destroyed. I mean, if we're going to take money and b- have a bank bailout, then why couldn't we take the money and say, let's help out our own people? I mean, is that too far off target? You're being logical, and these people are not logical. Well, they don't want to uh, help my the people. Belief, they want to take the entire system down. Well, yeah. And of course, Europeans in the United States to accept world government. I think this is what it's all about. Yeah, I think you're... Right on. Let's go to Mike and in so, Illinois. And so your solution is proper, but they don't want to do that, but then i got to tell you that. Well, but they are going to take two 747s to Hawaii instead of one also, and they're going to have private designers design all of her clothes, and then they're going to play like they care about the people with 27 fireplaces in their house. Give me a break. Mike in Illinois, you're on the air with Bob Chapman. Go ahead, please. Hi. Hi there. Yeah, but, uh, that's a great point. At the same time... <laughs> Are we all looking at what um, gold denominations that we can get? Um, I am confused by all the different countries, and and it seems to me like collectible prices. But uh, could you explain the differences in the gold prices for me? Okay, uh, Bob, this is a really good question because a lot of people want to know, okay, why is the Eagle um, the, the uh, eagle uh, a different price than the Cougarand than the whatever? If it's all an ounce of gold, why is it a different price? Well, some of them are not an ounce of gold, so they vary. Uh, that, w- that would be uh, cut into it. And then there's the attractiveness of the coin itself. Uh, it, when, when gold coins first in, in their... Uh, bullion form came out in the 70s when it was legal to own them. Uh, the first two out of the starting box were the Austrian Corona and the uh, Krugerrand. 
Well, what has happened since then is they are not so popular as they were before, and so the premiums to buy them are lower. And, you know, it's inexplicable because gold is gold, and two coins have the same weight and the same general right. composition. Uh, there shouldn't be a difference, but there is, and that's what markets are all about. And so you've got to make a choice. Uh, and, you know, there's a number of choices to make. And uh, if you don't know what to do, you buy them all. <laughs> I see. But, I mean, for instance, let me just say that the uh, gold maple is uh, less now than the gold eagle. Now, an ounce of gold is an ounce of gold, so why would an ounce of uh, gold maple be cheaper to purchase than an ounce of gold eagle? Well, perhaps there's more dollar-based U.S. buyers, and they would prefer to have what could be considered their own national coin. So there's a preference there. They were willing to pay a little higher premium for that coin rather than have a Canadian coin. Okay, and then the gold eagle is, I mean, the gold buffalo is even way above that. Now, you, right. also let me ask you, do you uh, uh, advise people buying numismatic coins? Uh, yes, because the premiums are so low. It's a, they've never been this low before. But they must be mint state and graded. Circulated numismatic coins are the same as melt coins, which is like an eagle or uh, Canadian and so on. And so uh, there's no real advantage. People talk about uh, it being uh, pre-1933 and that it's not confiscatable. Look, less than 2% of the American population own coins. In the 1930s when they did that, and they only got 25% of the coins, and they only prosecuted one person for not turning them in, and then they gave them uh, a fine that uh, amounted to very little. Hey, also, I, uh, but people this, ran around with coins in their pocket. They don't do that anymore. Yeah, Fox Business News said everybody needs to have six months of cash on them. Yeah, what happens if the bank calls it? We'll be back after this break. Stay tuned to the Power Hour. This is Joyce Riley. Welcome back to the Power Hour. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for caring about your world. There is a posting on ZeroHedge.com about analysis of the global insurrection against neoliberal economic domination and the coming American rebellion. Pretty strong words. It's going to be in the email blast so that you can check it out. The coming American revolution at Zero Hedge. I just want to ask Bob Chapman. Bob, does the uh, Zero Hedge, they seem to be pretty much on the, sort of on the, uh, uh, edge all the time with what they're saying. Yeah, I would say that so. Um, I think uh, very often what they have is a reiteration of what others have said, but that's okay. It's a form of bundling the news, and uh, it gives people very often their viewpoint on the news. It's something similar to what I do. Oh, I think it's, you're the first one out there, and then they all jump on board and said, oh, yeah, I well, was thinking that also. Uh, by the, the ultimate way, compliment. <laughs> I'm sorry? The ultimate compliment. That's right. That's right. And if you want to get a copy of the newsletter, if you've never seen a copy of the, the International Forecaster, you can call 800-686-2237, 800-686-2237, and always tell anybody the Power Hour sent you. Uh, let's go um, to Janice in Michigan. Janice, you're on the air with Bob Chapman. Go ahead, please. Yes. Hi, Joyce. Hi there. Hi, Bob. Um, I, I have a, two qu major questions, but there, there's some qualifying questions within those that I would like to it's kind of conversational. They're important to me. Um, I agree about the banksters, you know, taking over the world currency. And if, in, in light of that, if and when the dollar falls, what will happen to the stock market? Will it crash or what? And if it does, uh, will it be, be before the dollar falls, after it falls, or as the dollar falls? That was the first question. There's not a simple answer to that. And the reason why we don't know what form it's going to come in, um, if we wake up a week from now and one morning, let's say it's next Monday, and we find out that the U.S. government has devalued the dollar unilaterally, yes, the market would come out of bed in a big way. 
um, especially if it was in semi-weakened or, or weakened state because it was overpriced. Uh, but I think the way that these countries, which are all control, controlled directly and indirectly by the same group of people, uh, they would have a meeting, and at that meeting they would revalue and devalue currencies against one another. And they couldn't help but revalue and devalue these currencies versus gold at the same time. And they would have multilateral defaults, which would all be pre rearranged by experts. And when these people got to this meeting, uh, your currency is going to sell at such and such versus the dollar. And you're going to have to put backing of gold in your currency if you want to retain that value. And seeing you don't have any debt to speak of, you don't have to write anything off. With the United States, it would be totally different. Uh, they might say, uh, let's use the, the Swiss franc, which is the strongest currency in the world. They might say, uh, your currency has been devalued, the U.S. dollar, by two-thirds versus the Swiss franc. So it now takes three times as many dollars to buy a Swiss franc. And if you want to keep that level, with a dollar, you're going to have to put 25% backing. And as far as your debt is concerned with the world, collectively, uh, you can write two-thirds of it off, but you have to pay one-third of it back. And that's the kind of thing I think is going to happen. Okay, we'll be back after this break. Do you have another question for him, Dennis? I was just also wondering in that first question what was going to happen to the stock market. Stock market. Okay, we'll get that off air or I'll get it uh, on air for you. and You can uh, go ahead and drop off. And then Stan, George, and Steve, you're up next. Stay tuned to the Power Hour. We'll be right back. One minute, ten seconds. It's 58 minutes after the hour. We'll be back for your information. We're talking with Bob Chapman today, the International Forecaster Newsletter. He authors it. And it is amazing. It has got all the information in it. It's got the leading information that you're going to need. You can get a copy by calling 800-686-2237. You get one trial copy, see how good it is, and then you can subscribe at 800-686-2237. Tell them that the Power Hour sent to you. Uh, what about, uh, Bob Chapman, the stock market? What will happen to the stock market? It'll go down, and if they don't have that kind of meeting, uh, it'll go down precipitously. And it's just not the American market. All markets will. I think the only exception to that would be gold and silver shares. Other than that, everything would go down. Uh, to have the U.S. unilaterally devalue their currency and maybe even debt default to an extent uh, would be disastrous for the dollar and the stock market. It could quickly get down to on the Dow, 6,600 again. Wow. You know, we, uh, we, I, one thing I wanted to mention on Apple, we haven't been seeing much about uh, Steve Jobs because of his illness, and he looks quite ill from the information that we've seen on his cancer. They're really keeping that off the uh, pages uh, for people to, to read and think about, aren't they? They certainly are, and I think that's wrong. I think uh, whatever the situation with Mr. Jobs is, uh, is vital to the knowledge of the shareholders, and it's unfair to uh, mislead the public into thinking that, gee, he's going to be okay, and so on and so forth, when, in fact, uh, you as a former RN know darn right well with what he has, his chances of recovery are very, very small. Right, and um, uh, no former are in there. I still am. I'll just. <laughs> just oh, I'm sorry. Oh, please. that's okay. Oh. That's okay. That's okay. No Forgive problem. Forgive me. No problem. No I problem. didn't know. We'll talk about it off air. Uh, no, <laughs> no. But seriously, this man is quite ill, and to portray the company as being in good hands, I think, is also somewhat um, uh, deceptive to the people. Let's go to Stan in Missouri. Stan in Missouri, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. What's on your mind, Stan? Good morning, George. Morning. And Bob, I've got a comment for Bob and a question. My comment, Joyce and Bob, is I've been talking to some of the, the local groceries and the Dollar General store about a rising price of food cost. cost. Dollar General, in today and now, Joyce has put up a security camera because they have been having merchandise being stole out of Dollar General. $80 of merchandise is being stole out of 
Dollar General a day. And a local grocer told a friend in my uh, mine in Coal Camp, Missouri, his main concern with the rising price of food is eventually they're going to have to put up security cameras and probably maybe even eventually put have to put up barbed wire around the store to be keeping the store from being broken. Now, my question to Bob is, Bob, do you foresee food rights coming to the United States of America? Wow. Uh, it's possible and it's probable. Uh, there is systemic problems with production. We've seen uh, droughts and floods and and all manner of things like the freezing of the crops in southern the southwestern United States as well is into Mexico. I mean, the whole crop is wiped out. And so there are going to be shortages. And, of course, the food will go to the highest bidder and uh, will ever pay the most for it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's going to continue. Uh, I think uh, government engineering with HARP has got a great deal to do with it. And I think it's it's part of their plan to put people in a, 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 a very difficult position. Uh, Bob, can you stay with us three more minutes after this next break? Of course. Oh, thank you so much. I would like to uh, get George and Indiana on the air. I apologize uh, we, to uh, Captain Sweeney. We're going to be back after this three-minute break, and we'll, we'll bring on Captain Sweeney after we get to a couple of questions. We'll be back. This is Joyce Riley. I'm talking to Bob Chapman right now, and in all fairness, I want to get to a couple of questions that we had here. Let's go to George in Indiana quickly. George, you're on the air with Bob Chapman. Go ahead, please. Hi, Joyce and Bob. Hi. Uh, my question, uh, and I have a comment too, Joyce, please, but uh, the question is, what's the, best, what's the best way to buy the gold and silver to not create a big paper trail? You know, uh, how can you buy it? Um, I think uh, if you deal with smaller dealers, um, I think your chances of uh, not having records per se uh, are, are uh, you know, that's the way to do it. Uh, I found that I've never heard of government going and checking the records of uh, vendors, uh, brokers of gold. Uh, they could do that in the future. And, I don't know how long they keep their records. Um, perhaps someone could tell us, but I, I'm kind of thinking it's just a couple of years. Okay, I think so, that would be a good question for us to add. Uh, ask uh, Ted Anderson. Hey, thank you very much yeah. for the phone call. Uh, appreciate it, George and Indiana. Quickly, Steve in Ontario, Canada. Go ahead, please. Steve, you're on the air. Go ahead with Bob good morning. Chapman. How's it going? Hi there. Um, I just wanted to ask Bob, like many times you've said that uh, – um, Canada seems to be in pretty good financial shape. Um, but if it does come to an American dollar devaluation, would Canada have to devalue in lockstep for fear of their currency going up too high, or would they just let it float? And Because it's already at 102.7 against the dollar right now, so it seems to be going up already. So what do you think the Canadian government would do? Well, I think that they try to hold it down as much as possible, but the Canadian dollar is going to continue to appreciate versus the U.S. dollar uh, because of the kind of economy they have. It's uh, uh, natural resource-based uh, to a great extent, and so that really helps them. Uh, the Swiss franc is another currency that just went from 116 to, like, 92, which means it was going up, and they have the same problem of their currency appreciating as the Canadian dollar has, but they have it for totally different reasons. All right. Um, thank you very much for that uh, answer. And, uh, unfortunately, I have to let you go. It has been very interesting today. Thank you so much, Bob Chapman. Anyone who wants to get a copy of the International Forecaster Newsletter, that is, if you want to know what's going to be happening uh, very shortly, because he's always on top of the information, go to theinternationalforecaster.com. Or you can call Midas at 800-686-2237. And any questions you have regarding gold or silver, call Midas, 800-686-2237, and tell them the Power Hour sent you. Bob Chapman, look forward to it in two weeks. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, and thank you all for listening.